Hello, everybody. Um, so they said, we don't want you to do a talk at MongoDB World this year, but could you do a chalk talk? Um, and I said, what's a chalk talk? And he said, it's a small group of people. It's casual. We're going to just give you a whiteboard, and you know, you're just going to lead an interactive discussion. So that's what this is. This is a small group of people, casual interactive discussion. Now, can anybody see what's missing? A whiteboard. <laughs> Fortunately, I had put together some slides to use in the event that there was no whiteboard, and also just to sort of set the scene a little bit. So um, there's a bit of a presentation at the start here, because I'd just like us to get some common language and make sure we're thinking about the same thing. But um, there's also very much, hopefully, scope for Q&A at the end. Um, so it's not even a case of, you know, please ask questions. It's a, it's a good chance to ask any questions you have about sharding, but I just want to try and maybe answer some common ones at the start. Um, quick show of hands, because, you know, it says interactive, which means I get to ask you to do things. Uh, show of hands if you are using sharding at the moment. Okay, that's a, a small number. Quick show of hands if you've considered using sharding but think it's way too scary. <laughs> it's fair. I, I like the honesty here. Okay, so let's talk about what sharding is first. I, I should have done a show of hands as to who knows what sharding is. So it's basically a way of taking a collection and distributing it, distributing it over multiple replica sets so you get more resources. A replica set can only be so big. It can only be so big because a um, there becomes a point where a single replica set becomes hard to manage, uh, or b um, you just can't get a big enough box to put it on. You know, nowadays you get some fairly big boxes, but you're still going to be capped at you know respectably probably about two terabytes of RAM. And if you happen to have enough indexes and a big enough data set that two terabytes of RAM isn't enough for you, you're going to have to find a way of getting a bigger box. Um, the reason you need replica sets is to provide resilience. Generally, sharded data is bigger data. Um, we're going to spread it over multiple machines. You know, if, my, if, if a typical PC, a typical server, breaks once every three years, and I have my data on one server, then once every three years, the server breaks. If I have 100 servers, then once every nine days, a server breaks. And so I, I need to have replica sets to make sure that you know, mean time between failure doesn't kill me. So why would you use sharding? There's a few different use cases for it. Uh, geographic segregation for lower latency or compliance. Basically, if I absolutely need to keep some of my data inside the EU, and some of it in the United States, and some of it in Singapore, um, I can spread a replica set round, but then I can only write to the primary in the replica set. So what I will do is I'll have a sharded cluster um, with a full replica set in each region. So it's a sort of large global virtual database, but the, the data physically lives in a single location. The main reason people use sharding, scaling beyond the resources of a single server. As I say, you know, in a replica set, you're limited by the size a server can be. Some data sets are much larger than that. Um, to answer that question, how big can a sharded cluster be, I was talking to an actual MongoDB customer in Berlin about a month ago, and I knew of this customer, and I knew they were using sharding, but when I asked how much data they had, they said, uh, one of our clusters has, wait for it, 35 petabytes of data in it. That's a big cluster. I also asked, apparently, uh, 2,000 replica sets, 2,000 shards. Um, so um, you need to shard to scale out. That's the thing. Why do we use sharding to scale out, to deal with data that needs more resources than you get in a single machine? Um, one of the things, though, is how do we decide for any given record which shard it lives on, which replica set it lives on? So my record might be over here, whereas Graham's record might be over there. How do we make that decision? That's what the shard key is for. So the shard key is one or more fields in your data, the values of which determine where that record is stored. So basically, whatever the values are in there is going to be used to look up a table and work out where we're going to put that particular piece of information. 
and MongoDB actually decides on ranges of values that will go on each server. So in the simplest case, maybe I have two servers, and MongoDB goes, right, okay, names A to M go on that, and M to Z go on that. That's the simplest way to describe it. If I had three, it goes, right, A to J go there, J to P go there, and P to Z go on that one. And those ranges can change over time. MongoDB can make the ranges smaller. It can split them. It can actually move them about and move the documents between servers. But an important point is choosing the correct field to use can have a huge impact on the performance of your system. And this is the how do I choose my shard key? How do I choose which fields in my data I should use to divvy the data up? I don't know if that, that word works in America, but to, to divide the data up between the different servers. Everybody's very quiet, but I'm seeing some nods, so either you're asleep or you are understanding. Thumbs up. See, I like, see, I've got used to Zoom, you know, where like a little thumb appears to tell me that somebody's, somebody's heard me. <laughs> okay, so uh, what are the properties of a good shard key? You know, how do we know this is a good shard key? Well, firstly, it, it needs to have enough cardinality to allow an even distribution of values. So if I have a, you know, a field and it's maybe... US state, that might not have enough values in it. It's only going to have 50 values in it to divide up evenly and nicely across multiple servers. It might work, but really you want to be thinking in terms of big data and you want to be thinking in terms of more cardinality. Although bear in mind, you can have multiple fields that you use. So US state plus date, for example, has almost unlimited cardinality. So that can be divided up. The important thing is that you need to be able to provide the value of the shard key in the majority of operations. Obviously, when I insert a document in the database, I need to supply the value for the shard key fields because otherwise it doesn't know where to store them. But when I go to query the database, wherever possible, I also want to be able to supply that shard key field so it knows which server to look on because if it doesn't know which server to look on, it has to look on all of them. And my scalability is going to be way better if every query that comes in goes to one of my 100 servers or one of my 10 servers rather than every query goes to all 10 of them. You know, you appreciate the only way we can divide this load up is by making sure that not every machine has to deal with every query. It's also good if you have a shard key that has a fairly even distribution of values or rather you don't have a single value in there for your shard key, which has dramatically more um, records than anything else. Because for any individual value of a shard key, all the records with that value are going to live on the same server. So you really don't want to have one value that exists in 50% of your records. Question? Let, let me get to that, because I think, I think there, there are two orthogonal concepts. Firstly, every shard key must have an index. That's just one of the rules. So you have to index your shard key. You index for your database. So this, this is more about partitioning the data. So you will have an index on it as well as the shard key. You, the, you must have an index on your shard key. So it doesn't matter what other indexes you have, you must have an index on your shard key. But um, I'm going to ask, uh, unless, unless I've said something that you don't understand, and this is, you know, can we wait till the end of the presentation for questions? So if you want me to clarify what I just said, that's fine. But other questions, we're going to hold to the end, because I do want to get... I will probably answer that in the next few slides, and then we'll, we'll get to that. So properties of a good shard key, we don't want anything that's got too many values. So for example, we could pick a field that has a range of different values, but 50% of our records actually just have 
No, that would be a bad shard key because all of those ones would just go into you know, the same place. And also, it's a good idea to have a, to pick your shard key to be a field that is not continually increasing. So do not create a shard key just on a date. Do not create a shard key just on a, um, uh, an object ID, the MongoDB default key. Because what will happen then is every new record will end up going to the same server. That's a bad idea. So I'm going to suggest that there are two different kinds of systems in MongoDB. People build two different kinds of systems, or two different kinds of large systems. So arguably, only large systems need, a, need, need to use sharding. You know, If you have less than a terabyte of data, you probably don't need to shard. Um, there are two kinds of systems that have more than a terabyte of data. There are ones that have a lot of users, and there are ones that don't. <laughs> um, they both have lots of data. So sometimes um, they've got a lot of data because they've got lots of users, <coughs> and each user has their own data, and each user deals with their own data. Or they, I say users, but those could be physical users, or those could be machine users. They could be something like uh, a vehicle which sends telemetry data. They could be a machine. But there's lots of them, each individually generating data for mostly their own use. And then you have systems that have a very large amount of data but have a very small number of users. Analytic systems. You know, has lots of data but may only be used by, you know, a dozen analysts who do, you know, analysis and stuff like that. Um, so actually, we need to think about choosing our shard key differently for those two different kinds of systems. One that has lots of independent users, be they human or machine, and one which has a small number of users, almost certainly human. And I will say now that I generally think it's very easy to choose a shard key. The, the reason people sometimes think it's not easy is because they've never been to any talk where somebody explained to them the rules for choosing a shard key. And so they pick, there are horror stories of people just you know, choosing a field at random because they heard it partitions up the data, but they didn't apply any rules to how they choose it. I, I honestly could say I have never had difficulty with a customer choosing a shard key. It's always been very, very obvious what they should use. So um, in a many user system, users tend to work with their own data or data relating to a specific type of thing that they're doing. They don't really look at other people's data. In an email system, users look at their own emails. They don't look at other people's emails. So the shard key should be their email address. You know, they know or their identity. You know, divide the data up by the user who owns those emails. In a bank system, a bank retail system, now that's an interesting one because obviously in a bank system, retail bank, my wife works in retail banking, you don't divide it up by the end users, you would divide it up by the bank accounts because those are the individual things that you're working with. You look at one bank account or another bank account, very seldom are you looking across multiple accounts. Perhaps you might divide it up by a customer ID so that you can look at the multiple accounts belonging to one customer, but generally you're, you're going to be getting things by a bank account. Um, it's nearly always easy to find a shard key because every record in the system has an owner. I'm going to stand a little bit side of this. I feel bad standing behind that. Um, so when you look at the record, you'd say, who owns this record? When I'm looking for this record, am I doing it as a person? Am I, am I able to say, well, you know, this is John's record, and I can add to my query, and by the way, the record belongs to John. In that case, that's the shard key. And that's this key thing that in every query you do, every time you query the system in these you know, many user systems, you want to supply the shard key as part of your query. You know, I'm querying and I'm saying, you know, I'm looking for an email 
and I know that email mentions vacation time, and I know that email mentions Hawaii, because that's where I was going to go, but also importantly, it's my email. Don't do that, you hit the microphone. Um, so choose your shard key to be the owner of the record, you know, the, the unique identifier, whether it's a bank account or whether it's a person. Now, the other side of this is few user systems. These systems where there are just lots and lots of data and a small number of users. In my experience, those users tend to look across all of that data. They, they're not looking for data very specifically most of the time. They're actually looking at it from an analytical perspective. And the records don't have that dividing up or ownership. In that case, what you're looking for is pretty much any shard key as long as it has enough cardinality to make sure that the data gets evenly distributed. The value is not going to be included in your queries. If I'm doing you know, broad analytics across a set of data, I have data about all my customers, and I want to be able to go in there and run analytics and work out the average spend per customer compared to you know, when they joined and when, how long they've been using us and how often they use us. These are all broad queries. These are analytic queries. So I really just want a shard key that's going to be evenly distributing the data. Um, and the answer is any kind of nearly random value will do. In fact, in truly analytic systems like that, you can literally kind of almost add a random number field and use that. Not a great idea for reasons I'll explain in a moment. So what I did say is that MongoDB defines the range of shard key values that live on each server. And, each, and it basically it will define these, what's called a chunk, which is a set of values that will live on a server. Oh, the clock's not going. <laughs> so I should have looked at the time. Um, I've got what? 13, okay. Um, so MongoDB moves these chunks of, MongoDB can basically see these chunks of data, and if it sees there's too much data on any particular server, they're in balance, what it, well, unbalanced, what it will do is it will say, okay, well, you know, we're storing all the values from this to this on this server, so I'm gonna change that definition and say, now actually we're storing the values, maybe we were storing the values from um, F to J on this server, so now I'm gonna say, well, we're storing F to G and G to J on that server, and then I can move one of those sets of data to another server. It's called balancing. It's where we move data around. It keeps an even amount of data on each server. But on the other hand, balancing is bad. Because every time I move data, I have to read the data. I have to write it to another server. And then I have to delete it on the original server, which is another write. So I'm adding load to my system. I am adding reads and writes to my system to move data around. And guess when people most frequently do this? When their system is heavily loaded. Hmm. You know, my system has grown. It's now struggling with only two servers. I will add a third server. Not good, because now we're going to have to move a third of your data from onto that new server. And that's going to place additional load on the system. So I would argue that balancing is something you want to avoid. The MongoDB balancer is not your friend. It's there to get you out of trouble, but I like to think of this, it's like a garbage collector. You know, if I could explicitly free up memory when I no longer needed it, the garbage collector wouldn't kick in when I didn't want it to. I also need to talk to you about the increasing value problem briefly. If you pick a value for your shard key that just keeps increasing, there will be a chunk somewhere where all of those values go. Wherever that range is, it's going to go in there. And so um, this has been a common problem we've seen where people just pick the default uh, document ID, the value of underscore ID in MongoDB, and all the writes go to one server. And then the balancer has to move them off that server and move them to something else. So we're actually, we're not increasing our write capacity of our system because everything's being written to the same server. And we're actually reducing it because that server is also having to deal with deleting those records as they're moved somewhere else. So um, think to yourself, you know, do I have an increasing shard key? 
there's also this question of should I hash the shard key? So one thing MongoDB lets you do is say, don't use the values of those fields directly to decide where they go. Take the values of those fields and hash them and then move them around. Now, hashing sounds like a great idea because that gets around uh, a problem where you might have uh, too many similar values which end up on the same server. It also gets around that, theoretically, that problem of an increasing value because if I take an increasing value and I hash it, then I no longer have an increasing value. I have a value that, you know, if I hash one, two, three, and four, I'll get values which are varyingly larger or smaller than each other. That sounds like a simple solution. I would highly recommend, and here's, here's the takeaway from this, do not use hash sharding, okay? Why would you not use hash sharding? It sounds like a simple solution to the problem, okay? Um, writing to a cluster with a hash shard key hashes your shard key, but as the cluster grows, it gets slower and slower and slower. And to be clear, you start to see this when you start to hit the tens of millions of records mark. So you might think, well, that's not a problem. But again, this is about sharded clusters. Sharded clusters are about bigger sets of data. Tens of millions of records is not lots of records. Just a little uh, picture from a customer system. Uh, this customer was loading data into a sharded cluster. They started off at 20,000 records per second writing. That's a fairly high rate, given they were doing this continuously. But what you see is that over the course of a few hours, the system drops down to 5,000 writes per second. This is the problem with hash sharding, is under load, hash sharding gets slower and slower and slower. Let me explain why. So, in MongoDB, indexes are trees. They're binary trees. So, if you think about an increasing value going into the database, um, what will happen is that each value will be slightly larger than the one before, or thereabouts, and will move down the right-hand side of that tree. It will read the bits in green, and it will dirty the bits in red. So, every item basically is going down the side of the tree, and the stuff over on the left-hand side of the tree is not being touched very much, the dark green part. If, on the other hand, I put random values into a B tree, something very bad happens. This, because every value starts at the top and we say, is it bigger or smaller than this? It goes to the next one, is it bigger or smaller than this? And because it's a random value, it kind of bounces down this tree in a random manner and then dirties a bit at the bottom, meaning we need to write it to disk. So putting random values into a binary tree or into a B tree is pathological worst case for it. And guess what those hash shard keys are? They're random values. So what you get is you get much higher I.O. requirements, much higher RAM requirements for your shard key index. So challenges that we might get with sharding. Our data might be badly distributed. You know, we really want to have a shard key that distributes data evenly across our servers. Um, also, scaling out a cluster can take resources right at the time you don't want to take it out. Because if your cluster is heavily loaded and you think, I'm going to add more, no more shards at this point, it's going to have to move the data onto those shards, as well as dealing with your ever-increasing load. So I'm going to finish off my bit of this presentation by talking to you about a way of designing shard keys such that you get around this problem, so that you get instant scale out, uh, so that you get even balancing, so you can turn off the balancer and never have anything to do with the balancer ever again. And as a bonus, you actually get the opportunity to take older data and move it to cheaper hardware. You know, once you reach the stage where you know, old data is no longer required. You can downgrade the hardware on it. This is an expert level technique to avoid sharding pitfalls. This is something called managed sharding. You will not find information about managed sharding anywhere on MongoDB's website because this is a fun, deep internal secret that we tell paying customers who come along and listen to the secrets that we don't just tell people who look at our website. So don't, don't hunt for this on the website. You won't find it. It means we never need to enable a balancer. The data is always balanced. Our indexes don't slow down as they grow. 
we can provision new servers, new shards instantly, and we can age out our data onto smaller, cheaper hardware. Now, come on, show of hands, who thinks that's a good thing? Who thinks this should all be done automatically for you by MongoDB? The good news is that the team that are building serverless are baking this technology into this. So I'm, I'm sort of telling you how serverless is gonna work once they get that part of it implemented. Of course, in serverless, you won't have to worry about any of this. It will just magically do all of it for you. But this is how. Okay, so assume we have already picked our shard key value, okay? Remember I told you it's easy, right? It's either we don't really care, it can be fairly random, or um, actually it's the owner of the data. You can look at a piece of data and you can say, when I'm querying, what can I add in to narrow down the set of data I'm gonna look at? We also, have a timestamp value in all of our records. If we don't have one, we should add one. Okay, let's add a, a date timestamp value in there. And that can be the date the record is created. That's fine, we're not gonna change it. Once you, uh, although you can change the value of a shard key in MongoDB, that means it has to be read and written to somewhere else. You don't wanna do that if you can avoid it. Don't pick a value for your shard key that you expect to change. So, we're gonna go with say, email address, because that's, a, that's the obvious owner and a timestamp. When, when we received the email, sounds pretty good, or when we sent the email. Um, so we're gonna use emails as our example for this. Email, Larry at anycorp.com, it's got a timestamp, it's got a subject, um, I've had an offer to buy any corp, what do you think? It didn't used to say any corp, but somebody complained when I had uh, <coughs> in there. Anyway. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add an extra field to those documents, and we're gonna do that in our own code. We're gonna write code to add a computed hash. And what we are looking for is a low cardinality hash where the cardinality of the hash is a massively compound value, okay? So we're looking for basically something which is random and has a range of values which isn't particularly big but which divides by lots of things. So we assume we have a function, hash to integer, I give it an email address, it gives me back a number, a big number, you know, a 32-bit a, a number. I then do modulo two times three times four times five, which is 120, or two times three times four times five times seven. Two, three, four, five, six, I think that's the best one to use. So basically 120 or 840. So then in this case, we end up with this SK value being 65, okay? You'll understand why we do it like this in a moment or two. And our shard key for our collection is gonna be this little low cardinality compound number, SK, and our timestamp. So the timestamp's added in there um, to, to let us kind of move data around based on time, right? And we also make sure that when we do any queries against this database, we also add that field in there. So if I want to query for Larry at anycorp.com, I also, in my code, have to add that computed shard key. So this will find um, the last 10 records for Larry at anycorp.com. It will uh, hit only one shard. Um, we don't need the timestamp in there, even though it's in the shard key, providing just the SK bit is gonna be enough. Um, and we should also have an email on uh, have an index on, say, email and timestamp. Because remember, the shard key index isn't necessarily the one it uses to query. We use the shard key to work out which servers to query. When we get to the server, we can use any index on that server for our query. Now, here comes the fun bit. Before we put any data into the database, we are going to tell MongoDB to create us a whole bunch of empty chunk ranges, okay? So assuming we have three shards, we know that SK goes from SK0 to SK119. Uh, we're using, you know, we're, it's only got 120 values. And so we say, put, we tell MongoDB, I would like you to create me a shard key range of SK0 timestamp zero to SK1 timestamp zero and put that on shard one. And you can see here that we've done 40 on one, 40 on another, 40 on another. So we've explicitly partitioned this data and said, I want a third here, a third here, a third here, based on this randomly computed value. Now we're gonna get our writes evenly distributed. 
we're not going to move anything with the balancer, and this system is just going to work absolutely perfectly in terms of, of spreading the data over there. Here comes the really fun part. Now we need to scale our system out, and we do not want to have to move data around to scale our system out. We want to add three new shards and have those come online instantly. You know, I need more space. I need more throughput. I need it now, or at least at, at, you know, in two hours' time. So we provision our new shards, and then we create chunks on those shards which are the remainder of the time period, i.e. from two hours from now until infinity for each of those values of SK. So you see at the top, we still have the ranges we had, but we split SK0 so that SK0 timestamp zero to SK0 timestamp X stays on shard one. Meanwhile, SK0 timestamp X to SK1 timestamp zero moves onto our new shard. So we do this, and we've got this value of x. x is just sometime in the near future. What will happen then is MongoDB will keep writing to those first three shards until we hit time x. And after that, all new data will immediately be written to those three new shards. Now this expanded out to give us more capacity, but what if we also wanted more throughput? What if we didn't want to just have more space? We needed our user base had grown, and now we needed to be able to write 40% you know, more new records. Well, that's why we have this massively compound number. Now we can do this. So we keep our original three shards, but we add five more. And we divide the data up across the five, so now we get that faster throughput onto the five. Now, just to be clear, you can't use this if you're just gonna add one new shard. You know, This is when you're playing you know, in the big leagues because you've got this throughput and you know that you know, you're gonna have to add at least the same capacity again or more. Um, but by doing this, I actually added four shards there, but I've divided that data up into four. And in two hours time, it's gonna be over those four shards. So it scales out fast for more performance and space. So pros, scales out instantly. It's always well balanced. Also, you can download the older shards. You know, imagine this is an email system. You're running the next version of Gmail. And you've decided to take on Google, and now you're running a webmail system. Those four shards that we've got there are gonna have everybody's recent mail. The three original shards are only gonna have mail, you know, and in two years' time, that's all gonna be two-year-old mail. So I can download, the, downgrade those three original shards to much lower spec hardware, because nobody ever goes and looks at their old mail. Um, so cons, you can't just go from three to four shards. You can't scale up a little bit. You have to scale up by at least 100% of your original set every time. It does need extra coding from your developers, and it needs to be thought about at day one. Um, and when you query for a range of shard keys, because it's hashed, we're gonna send it to multiple shards. So this isn't for everyone. As I said at the start of this, just choosing a simple shard key shouldn't be hard or scary, you know, it normally, you look at your data, it's obvious either there is ownership and that's what you have, or um, you just pick a value that will give you enough cardinality to spread it around. Avoid hash shard keys, but if you really want a scalable architecture that's gonna see you into the future, um, then you either gonna use MongoDB serverless and let us deal with this, or go ahead and use this method for managed sharding. And that's all I have to say. I bet I've got no minutes left for questions, have I? <laughs> okay, there is a question. Everybody's leaving, but. How do you delete a shard key? What, what do you mean by delete a shard key? Okay, so as of MongoDB 5, we got the ability to change your shard key. You, you, can, you can run a command to tell it to change your shard key and it doesn't need to delete it. It will actually modify it in the cluster. Ah. Ah. 
how do, so how do you complete, convert back to a replica set? So that is, it is possible. Um, the first thing, you, you can do that, but you can also tell it, you can basically tell it to delete all the shards except one. Um, and then it is, there are instructions on the website to convert that. There, there are definitely instructions. Yeah, but you can get rid of that. Yes. Yeah, there are instructions on the website to convert a sharded cluster back to a replica set. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, it's both. I, I personally would never use uh, secondaries for reading. Uh, we, we do have to leave the room, unfortunately. I think there's somebody else in the room.